Well, good morning, Sherwood Forest Community Church, everyone in the building. Are you dry? I bet they're dry online. Good morning to everybody online with us as well this morning. And uh, it's just good to share in the love of God with one another. We're going to have a great time of worship and um, we'll open God's word and see what God wants to, to say in our lives this morning. Uh, but it is good to be in the presence of God. It's good to share together. And I want to encourage people online, if you're feeling ready to come into church and to share in this atmosphere, it's great to have you with us, uh, but it'd be great to see you in the building as well. I want to read from Colossians this morning. Um, it's Colossians 3. And you know, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is is. Set your heart on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You know, this morning as we enter worship and it's wet outside, God will be delighted. Um, we've got a flooding garage, but we'll sort that out when I get home. We'll be fine with that. But you know, we've got to keep our eyes on above where Jesus Christ is seated on the right-hand side of God this morning. Whatever we're feeling, whether we're joyful or we've got issues in our life this morning that are pulling us down, I want you to stand and raise your voice to a mighty God and acknowledge and look upwards to who he is, Christ Jesus, who died in your place and was raised in your place that we might know a hope for an eternity, to be with him plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Let's stand and worship this morning and give our hearts over to him as we look upwards to him. Amen.
you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath and our loss, so we pour. So we just stay in this reverence of God's presence at the moment. Lord, we thank you that you're with us this morning and we sense your spirit in the house. We pray also, Lord, that you will, we will sense the presence online too. We thank you, Lord. Come on, let's just speak out some praises to Jesus. Lord, we magnify your name. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. You are worthy to be praised. We adore you. 
Lord, our confidence is in you this morning. You are still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Yeah, if you'd just like to take your seats for a moment. As I was driving along and I was thinking, we just put the, the clocks back, haven't we? And, uh, <laughs> do you know, why is it you always have this sneaky, perhaps it's just me, on a Sunday morning I'd be stood there or whatever and I'd be looking out, I wonder who's forgot and they come an hour late. <laughs> I wonder who's remembered and they've come an hour early. <laughs> but anyway, so that was it. And as I thought about it, I thought in the Bible, I seem to remember there was a time when the, the day stood still for 24 hours. And back in Joshua's time, and... Uh, he prayed that the sun would stand still and the moon would stand still and that uh, by doing that he would be able to fight and win the battle. And, and I started to investigate it. And apparently NASA in the 1960s came up with a, there's a guy that said that they, they by the solar system and the stars, they look back. And as they look back, thousands of years, was a 24-hour gap. And... Uh, I thought, this sounds interesting. So then suddenly this guy said, I remember going to Sunday school, and I remember him saying that the earth stood still, or the solar system stood still. And uh, so they read the Bible, they went into Joshua, and to right there it was for 24 hours. But the problem was, it only equated to 23 hours and 20 minutes. And uh, so there was a 40-minute gap. But then they remembered in Hezekiah, that in Hezekiah, that the Lord said, or he prayed, can, I, can we put uh, the time forward 10 degrees? And Hezekiah said, no, that's too easy. Let's put it back 10 degrees. And the equation was that that was another 40 minutes, which then came to the 24 hours. Now, <laughs> we don't need things to be proved that God is real, do we? We don't need these things. And some people will say, well, that's just a coincidence. But I believe in God, who is the great King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But I thought it was interesting. But while I was driving along, there were three statements that came to me. And that God, there is hope for the hopeless. The second one, there is faith for the faithless. And there is rest for the restless. And you know, without hope, what a world we have to live in. What do we live for? I remember, you might think of some hopeless situations that you've been in. There might have been one for the Mansfield Town supporters that they weren't going to win a game. But they won on Saturday after 14 games. But that's the same for other people as well. But there's hope for the hopeless. You know, I had hope that uh, we will see our son in America. And it's going to happen. And we've just stood firm because we need to have hope. I remember in Mark where Jesus was in the boat fast asleep and the waves were going and, and the disciples were saying, what, you know, how can you sleep? But there is always hope. And Jesus stood up, woke up and instantly and said, peace be still. Yeah. And there was peace be still. So whatever situation you're facing, you might find it's a hopeless situation. But God is in that situation saying, peace be still. Faith for the faithless. Faith that can be the substance of things not seen, but you know, it's the evidence of things we cannot see, but we see them through the eye of faith. Faith can be as small as a grain of mustard seed, and apparently that's very, very small, but uh, you know, when David was facing Goliath, David stood there, and he had faith in his God that he would win the situation over, and we all know that he did. Rest for the restless. Come unto me, Jesus said, all you that are weary and heavy laden. And I say to you this morning online, and I say to you in the church, come unto me. This is what God is saying to us with his unconditional love. It's an unconditional welcome. So, you know, one of the things as well, I was driving along, and on came the radio, and I think it was Premier, and it was uh, freedom reigns in this place. I believe freedom reigns in our church. Freedom reigns in our lives. Freedom reigns. Lord Jesus, I just want to pray again this morning that it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. We thank you, Lord, for your freedom that we have in you. 
Lord, may we ever remember that you died so that we will be set free, so we can stand firm. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus does reign in this place, and he reigns in our hearts this morning with mercy and grace showering from heaven. So I pray whatever situation you're feeling in, whether you're feeling restless, whether you're feeling hopeless, or whether you're even feeling faithless, we have the God who knows above all and is with us every day of the week. And I pray, Lord, that as we carry on this morning, that you will speak to us and we'll hear your voice. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in 
Hallelujah, what a powerful name. Jesus Christ, what a powerful name. There's power in the name of Jesus. We sang there that he's got no rival, no equal. Right, and I believe that he's got no rival, no equal. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the one that can provide for our every need. doesn't always answer our prayers as we would like, but he's the one that answers our prayers. He's the one that moves for us in our lives. He's the one that, that stirs up the ground, that moves us into a position where our feet can be planted firmly. God is an amazing God. God is a God who never fails us. God is a God who never runs away from us. God never moves from us. God never runs from us. God is always for us. God is always cheering us on this morning. And if you don't feel that, I want to encourage you that God is cheering you on this morning, whatever your circumstances, wherever you are, whether you're on the hilltop or you're in the valley, God is cheering you on this morning. Amen. 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 You know, when Paul started to talk, uh, I thought he'd been reading my notes. We're saying different things. But the holiness of God and the presence in this room. And he got us to stay standing. And I think that was good that we honour God and stay standing. In this moment, God, was in, God is with us in this place. And we have to take those moments in the presence of an almighty God to just stand and breathe in and to soak in the things of God this morning. And um, it is important... Because it helped me, Paul, to lead into what I was going to say. Because, you know, God has been speaking to me about moments. About moments in our life with Jesus Christ. But also, in, in, you know, God always teaches us. But, you know, none of us are perfect. And God wants me to share this. Because how many of us are always where our feet are standing? So what do I mean by that? Are we always in the place where our feet are? Is our mind somewhere else? Is it on a beach in Portugal? Is it in a room somewhere else? But we're not, if we're honest with ourselves, our feet, our mind is not always where our feet are standing. We're in a different place. Even in church, life group, prayer meetings. Prayer meetings is probably one of the biggest areas where we wander. We're not in the room at the same time. For the whole period, we are in the room for a percent of the time, but not all the time. We're not always where our feet are. Oh, we're easily distracted. You're going to tell me it's just me, aren't you, in the room this morning and online, that it's only me that gets distracted when we're praying, when we're worshipping. I'm praying I'm getting better at it. I'm praying because I want to be in the moment that God has for my life. I want to be in the moment that stirs your life. I want to be in the moment that stirs the life of this community. I want to be standing feet and mind in one body, the same place, the fullness of God, to see his glory come down upon this community, upon this church, and upon me and upon you, that you may grow into all that God has has created you to be. Paul, we stood in the presence of God in a freedom without prejudice and we were able to do it in that such freedom and we need to ensure that we honour God and stand in a moment because some people can't stand freely in the moment of God. We can and we should, we should do that and acknowledge that, that we can praise our living God. We can stand before a holy God and acknowledge who he is, that God does amazing things. God is an amazing God, one who came into this world to die for you and me this morning. He came to die for you and me online. He came to die for you, that you might know the forgiveness of sins, that you might know an eternity, a resurrection, an eternity with God this morning. And it may not always work out while we're here on earth, but God has a plan for eternity, for you to be with him, to be with him. So we can in a moment be physically present but mentally and emotionally, we could be somewhere else. I'm sure you've heard it said before, maybe it's only me in the room. But I just want to try and get this point because Jesus was always in the moment. Jesus was focused on the moment of where he was. I'm glad you're here online and in the building this morning. I just hope you stay the distance with me this morning and stay where your feet are and your mind stays focused. I believe God wants to bless us. I believe he wants to encourage us. I believe he wants to encourage the point where God is going to just transform our lives, that we can be at those moments in life with our families, with our neighbours, with our communities, with our workplaces, with our uh, customers, where we can speak out in that moment the presence of God because of our feet and our mind being in the same place. 
are just going to be transformed, not judged or condemned, but released through the power of the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, which I receive every single day. We must remember it's through grace, mercy. Now, I'm going to start in an unusual place. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to start in John's Gospel, chapter 2, 8 and 9. Now, I'm going to give you some context because I only want to read a couple of verses. I've got quite a bit of scripture to sort of paraphrase my way through. But to give you the context, this is a wedding feast in Cana. Jesus is there, the disciples are there along with other guests. And the embarrassment for the host is that they ran out of wine, which you just can't do. It's a big embarrassment. And he didn't know what to do. He hadn't even got cheap wine available. He got no wine. So Jesus' mother got him involved. He said, what are you bothering me for? And anyway, he called the servants and said, look, you see them clay jars over there. Now, just picture this. These clay jars are 20 to 30 gallons. So it says that in the Bible, but I thought I'd work it out in litres for you young whippersnappers who want it in metric. But it's 90 to 136 litres of wine these things will hold. That's some party. That's, that's some party. That's going to go well at some point. But, you know, so he gets that point, and then he says to the servant, go and do it. And then he says this to them in verse 8. He says, then he told them, the servants, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water did know. Then he called for the bridegroom, and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. Now, I don't know about you, it's probably just me, but I always thought that went on to say you, you save the, you know, you, you don't bring out the best till last. But it says you have saved the best till now. You have saved the best till now. Not saved it till the last, you've saved the best till now. And I want to encourage you with that because I believe that your best days are now. They're not behind you. They're not in front of you. Well, I believe that, that tomorrow will be your best day, but you get the point I'm trying to make, that today, now, is your best day. Lord, I just want to pray that this word will come and to draw us in, Lord God, to understand the moment that we're in. Uh, the moment that we're in in our lives, the moment that we're in in our families, in our communities, that you'll draw us in, Lord God, to the moment that we may understand the presence in our feet and our mind and our body will be in one place to hear from you, to receive from you, to see your kingdom come, your will be done in this place as we move our feet into various strategic places. Amen. I'm just so encouraged by the way Jesus lived. It's not just the truth that he taught. You know, last week I used the, the scripture from John 14, 6. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right, and he talked about the truth. We talked about the belt of truth last week in Ephesians 6. But you know, he says, I am the way. I am the way. And you know, sometimes we work on the truth, and that's not a bad thing. But there are times I believe God is focuses on the way that Jesus lived. Jesus wants to, to live in the way that Jesus lived. I think Andrew spoke on it probably early part of, or end of 2020 probably. Can't remember. Could have been last week and he'll tell me off later. But, um, but we've got to live in the way. And I'm just so encouraged that one of his significant qualities, no matter who he interacted with, no matter who he met, wherever he was going, Jesus was always present in the moment. Jesus was always present in the moment. I wish I could say that about myself. If I'm being honest, I can't. I'm still working through it. But each day I plan to get better. He's fully present. He lived in undivided attention in his moment, in his ministry, in his life. And we're going to look at two back-to-back -back stories in Luke. Now, I've got to say that the, these stories in Luke aren't the most detailed in the gospel. But it helps me to say back-to-back -back, because they follow on in Luke's gospel. Right? It just, you just see the way in which Jesus is moving through the moments in his life. Undivided attention. Now, we're going to go first to um, the story of the blind beggar, which is Bartimaeus in Luke 18. I 
I can't remember the Bible reading was then. It's here. It's at the back. That's not very well organized, is it? But again, Jesus is entering Jericho. Now, you might have thought the walls of Jericho had fallen, but it's been rebuilt by this time that Jesus got there. And if you've been a deep theologian, you could say it's not actually the same city that was there previously. That was further south. But this is Jericho. This is the place where Jesus is going into. There was large crowds, large crowds. Lots of hustle and bustle and dust and people wanted to get a, a, a bit of Jesus Christ, get a glimpse of him, get to see him, get to, get to see what he, was, what he was up to. And in all of this noise, hustle and bustle, Bartimaeus cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now the, the disciples went straight over, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but the disciples came over, rebuked him. I said, Jesus, far too important to deal with you. Stop crying out. You're distracting him. Um, we don't want him to took off course of what he's doing. Um, he's too important. He's got things to do, people to see. And then Jesus did what? He rebuked the disciples and said, bring the man to me. Bring the man to me. You see, Jesus at that moment in time broke off what he was doing. In the moment to be with a man who was hurting, singular, who nobody else cared for. He wanted to be with a man in that moment, in that presence. He broke off what he was doing because he knew this was important. This man was crying out. Then he asked that question that always frustrates me. What do you want me to do for you? Now, I often think about that, you know, and we're being encouraged to not skip over Scripture sometimes. What does that really mean? I haven't got time to go into it today. I could throw all sorts of things out at you that may or may not be deep theologically correct. But I just think at times Jesus wants us to to speak out what it is that we want. He knows what this man wants, but he wants him to speak it out, to ask Jesus for it. And he did. And Jesus spoke, healed him. And you could say that was a great miracle. And it was a great miracle. But I believe there's a second miracle, the fact that Jesus stopped to talk to a man that nobody else wanted to talk to, a single man who'd been blind from birth, who'd got nothing to give him, nothing to give back, but Jesus stopped because he cared for this man who was down on his luck. He wasn't where the Pharisees, the religious leaders thought he should be, but he was down on his luck, and Jesus stopped and said, your sight has been made well. Jesus was fully engaged in that ministry. He stopped for a man who nobody else really wanted to deal with. Probably they kicked him aside many times as they walked past, ignored him. You know, I have to say that there are times I've walked past people in Mansfield and they've asked me for a pound or a big issue. You know, and you have, you know I'm all showing on my good side because I'm going this way down the side. Now, I'm trying to change that, but I have this thing about giving money. So what I do is I buy a coffee right, because I don't know where the money's going, and they're not all in that way, but it's just, buy them a coffee, a bacon cup from Costa, it's so easy in Mansfield if you're down that way, but I'm trying not to ignore, or say that I've got to be somewhere, or I've got better things to do, but to actually give out, and in the moment, touch that person's life, touch that person's life. Then we're going to move straight in, straight after that story, into chapter 19, verses 1 to 2. And this time it says in now that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So now it tells us that this was a passing through moment. He wasn't planning on stopping. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. A chief tax collector. Now I know these days all our tax collectors are really nice people. We all want to pay our taxes and be good and they don't... uh, But then, then... Tax collectors were loathed. They were not treated very well. But this shows Jesus had time for the down and out, but he also had time for the rich and up. He also had time for the guy who had committed what could have been seen as an epic sin, robbing from the people and just taking money that they didn't have. But you know, it doesn't matter how bad or how good your luggage is this morning, Jesus cares for you. Jesus stops in the moment to minister to you. No matter how many people in this room, Jesus has got time to stop for each one of us through his presence of his spirit that God sent to be with each one of us. So no matter how bad your baggage, you know, we can have an argument about your baggage is worse than mine. It doesn't really matter, it's all baggage. 
It's all rubble. It's all waste in the background. It's not a competition. All we've got to do is jettison the baggage and know that Jesus in this moment has come to restore us and to rescue us and to be with us. Because Jesus, what? Jesus cares for you. He cares for every single one of us. So he stops with this guy. I don't know I'm going to do the song that I learned in Sunday school or not. It's a bit embarrassing, really. But Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed a sycamore tree so he could see, see. Right? <laughs> not very good. I'd never make a worship uh, singer. Uh, I'd love to be. People have said I should take lessons. I don't think it'd be any money. It'd be good after bad. Um, but, you know, he stops and he calls this guy by name. Zacchaeus. And then what does he do? And I've done this loads of times. He invites himself for dinner. <laughs> he invites himself for lunch. It's a skill of leaders of a church to invite yourself for lunch. <laughs> Paul, I'm coming around later on. But he said to Zacchaeus, I'm, get down from there, I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your house. But when you carry on to read that scripture, what amazes me is that Zacchaeus has a moment with Jesus. Zacchaeus has a moment. This is a guy that's got epic proportional sin in his life at this moment in time. And he has this thing about saying, you know what, I've done bad things. I'm paraphrasing slightly, so don't try and read this in the NIV and think this is exact word for word. But I've done bad things, I've done terrible stuff, I've robbed people. I've taken more than I should. But you know, I'm going to give um, half of all my wealth to the poor. It's a good start. But then I'm also going to give four times more back to the people who I've robbed from. He just blurts it out in this moment. I'm sure when he climbed the sycamore tree, he wasn't expecting to give away half of his fortune, pay back four times. But in the moment, with Jesus Christ, who stopped and called him by name, this guy decided and to know and out of light, come on, the lift got to the top to realise what he'd been doing. And Jesus, Jesus said what? Salvation, today, today, salvation has come into your house. Today, salvation has come into your house. How many of us want to hear that in our homes, in our families, in this church, in this community? Because we, our feet and our mind, we're together, we're in the moment, in that moment in time, we have a moment that we can say today, salvation came into your house house. We're the hands and feet. Jesus can't do it on his own. And I, I tell you this, I'm not pointing any fingers out there, I can tell you, because God is speaking to me. But we've got to get better at these moments. You know, uh, I've got a lot of statistics, and I'm probably running out of time. Hour extra in bed or not, I don't think I should take the hour up on this moment in time. But you know, Harvard did a study, and it says that on average... 40% of your wakened life is distracted and is not with your feet. Your mind and your emotions are detached from the rest of your body. 47% of your wakened life. You might be horrified by that, or you might be some good people in here that can say, I can't identify with that whatsoever. I can identify with that. I can identify with being distracted, mobile phones, mobile devices, being online, things like that, it, but on average, the, the, your phone, you touch your phone, because but you guys aren't average, are you? You guys in here are above average people, aren't you? But on average, we touch our phones 2,416 times a day. Right? That's what the study says. Now, if you're above average, which I think you guys are, I think you're amazing people, you're above average, we touch our phones 5,400 times a day. Now, I'm telling you, by the end of the day, you've not cleaned it down with an alcohol wipe, don't give it to me. <laughs> right? That's a lot, isn't it? And you probably think that's unbelievable. You, you know, you think it's unbelievable. But, you know, a text message comes in. A Facebook notice. I don't do anything like the social media stuff. I do Facebook, so I just want to try and keep up what you lot are trying to do. I don't do it that much. But I can tell you, I probably still fit into the average, touching the screen, because I've got four email accounts, I think, two for work, two for church. And they are distractions. So they make time. David Sherman, we were at a prayer meeting at the MIT, and he wasn't judging us, but we were in a prayer meeting. 
And he tried to encourage us to say, how many of you have been distracted in that hour? And people were trying to be honest about where they drifted off to, what they were thinking about, what we're cooking later on, what we're having for tea, all that sort of stuff. He said, I want you to think about how many times some of you have touched your phone. How many times? Now, look, believe me, I am not throwing this out at you guys to... to I'm just trying to make you think of the things that we do that distract us, that we sometimes don't realise the mobile phone has taken over our life. You know, when I first started selling, and I had everything south of the washing hall, right down to north of the Thames and the whole of Wales. I had to cover that, got me onto Harley Street, had some great um, sales trips, but I never had a mobile phone. You were putting reports out, putting them in an envelope, and posting them on the way around the rest of the country, or you went into one of those red phone box things that most of you won't remember, and you're dialing a number to try and talk to somebody. Of course, if it was after hours, you could never get them. But, you know, we get a text or an email now. And I don't mind that. I like it because I don't rely on post. But it's the offence that you can cause if you don't answer that text or that email immediately. Because it's in your inbox. People think that you should respond as quick as the fact it's just landed. And it's not always that easy. And I'm trying to, not to the point where I'm saying I'm going to ignore it for six weeks. But I'm just trying to control things. So when I'm praying now and when I'm preparing this on a Sunday morning, it's try and turn the phone off. Try and have the phone in a different room. And just use the laptop for the study instead. No, I'm just joking. But you see, all I'm trying to say is there's all things that we can do, but we live busy lives. We've got children. I know all the stuff that goes on. So I know there are things that distract us. I was trying to encourage you to think about being in the moment. And if you can't pray for an hour without being distracted, but you can pray for 30 minutes, it'd be better to pray for 30 minutes without distraction and pray for an hour with distractions in between. I can encourage you to do that. Mark, in life groups, I never get distracted. I'm 100% with you all the time, just so you know. <laughs> Except when I'm not there, of course. There's no cameras in the building. So we all can be distracted easily. And what I'm trying to do is just trying to help us to understand that Jesus was never distracted. He had an undivided attention to whoever he was with in that moment, in that day, in that time, no matter where he was walking, where he was going, he'd stop and say, Lily, I just want to tell you. He'd have time for everybody, despite his... I must have told you a story when I was doing prayer for the world. and We were in a board meeting upstairs, and a guy from the P&O company uh, said, he's in, he's, you've asked for a map, he wants to see you. So I go down and say, thanks for the map, I'm just going to put it on the wall. What, what are you doing? Oh, well, we want to put pins in the map and show where we've got contacts and where we're writing to, so people got a visual. He says, so you're a Christian with a capital C. I say, yeah, but I've got board. He says, tell me about it. What's it like to be a Christian? And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness me. There's eight people upstairs in the board meeting. I wasn't a director then. I was only a sales manager making a presentation. And I thought, well, it, 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 well, maybe there'll be a delay, a coffee break or a toilet break, and my bit will be delayed just a little bit. But I sat down for 15 minutes to explain. Now, I don't know where this guy is today. I don't know whether he made a commitment to Jesus Christ. I don't know where he is. But God just gave me a moment to be with him. And then when I got back upstairs, God had smoothed out all the moment, sorted it all out. They changed tack. They'd had a toilet break. They sent someone out to fetch it. It's all history. But what I'm saying is, I had a moment, but I had that feeling inside that it's a moment I shouldn't miss. That I had my feet and my mind, I had to stay in that foyer and not be upstairs in my mind, downstairs with my feet. Just an illustration of how it sometimes works. You know, we could play games in our head. We don't need a mobile phone, do we? What if? Well, if I can pass this test, I'll be okay. If I can do this, I'll be okay. If I can make that, I'll be okay. You know, when I get married, I'll be okay. When we have kids, I'll be okay. Then I'll have no money. But then the money will come back in because we'll get through it all. But if we can do that, and then, and then they'll go out in nappies, and, and then, then we'll have grandchildren, and I'll be in nappies. So that, no, forget that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, my sense of humor, you know me well enough by now. But... You know, this is not a criticism of Margaret. But you know when you've got three kids, you come home from work, Margaret stayed at home, Margaret had, did an amazing job with our children. But when I got in, 
it wasn't always tidy because there was a toy there, a toy there, I'd trip over it. Once I got in the mouse, it was dead. Uh, the rice pudding had gone off and all those sort of things. Now, I'm not criticizing that. But I've got to say that you, you, I'm trying to give you an example where you think, oh, I can't wait for the day when the house is ours, when the kids have left. I'm not tripping over toys. And now they've all left home. I wonder where the toys are. We've got the grandkids now. We had a moment where we didn't have any toys, but now we've got the grandchildren. I love it because I've learned this. Don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. Because I bet all the mums in here, dads, their children have left home. They've gone to be the university. We're lucky. All of our children live within five minutes. It's a great deal. It's quite unusual in this day and age. But we're not to miss what we have now. Because the future will come. And you'll blink and the children have grown up. The children have passed on. The grandchildren have grown up. The grandchildren have got married. And I just want us to live in this moment each and every day. It doesn't mean that Jesus is anti-planning. He's not. He's just saying, I think it's Matthew 6, 34, he says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He's not talking about not planning. We have to plan. But what he's saying is live in the moment of the day. Otherwise you'll miss the opportunity that God is presenting to you to grow your life, to touch someone else's life, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that moment. You know, doing okay. My clock must have slowed down slightly. But you know, I was thinking why we sometimes don't live in the moment. And I want to say this, I think this is important for somebody this morning, is you know, we can be so distracted sometimes by the past that we can't figure out and can't write. We just can't help that. And it produces low or lack of faith when we start to deal with something in our past that we can't deal with. I think Paul touched on it last week. Something similar. We can get really upset, freak out over something that we can't change. And I read this quote by Craig Rochelle. To be present in this moment is actually to surrender the past you can't change and trust God with the future you can't control. I repeat, I'd be present in the moment is to actually surrender the past you can't change and trust God with a future you can't control. Trust God with a future you can't control. Surrender the past that we can't change into his hands because God cares. God loves you. And he's already there in the future. He redeems you. He redeems the past and he's good in the future. He's been good in the past. He's good in the future. So let's be fully engaged in the moment. You know, one of the things that uh, business has suffered uh, a year or so ago, in James 4.13, it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year, then we trade and make profit. Then COVID comes and nobody can trade, nobody can go out, you've got to go for a walk on your own, you can't go to the shop. All these things come to test us. Yet you do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? For you are mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Now that's not anything, but our life is so short. As you get older, you realise just our life becomes short. And that's not me getting worried about growing old. Because growing old's a gift. Do you know what I mean? Growing old's a gift. I'm not worried about growing old. But time just passes by so quick. You know, if you've ever gone to a window in a shop and you've breathed on it, it comes up, then the mist disappears. And that's what the scripture's saying. Our life is like that. It's like a breath. It's like a mist that comes and goes. So what we've got to do is we've got to live in the moment and be all that God's created us to be, to do all the things God's asked us to do, to be in the moment, to do the things that he says. You know, I've left a prop behind um, somewhere. It's probably down under my chair somewhere. I tried to get a video. I should have asked Ryan earlier, and he probably found one for me, but everything I looked at, I had to pay for, so I wasn't doing that. Um, But, you know, the games that we play at home, and we're games at home, board games, always comes with a little hourglass 
for the time that you've got to either do the charade or you've got to think up a word. You know, life can be a bit like an hourglass. You know, we look at it and we look at it and we just don't know how much sand is left on top. Some people think they do. They think they know how much sand is left on top. But we don't. None of us know. None of us know how much sand is left on top. Then, no matter what we do, no matter what we try, we can't stop the sand coming through the hourglass. The sand keeps flowing. So I've made a determined effort to say, I'm going to live every day. I'm going to try and live in the moment. I'm not perfect, but, and I might not succeed at every moment in time. But it shouldn't stop us trying to succeed, to be all that God has created to do, to live in the moment, as Jesus lived in the moment for you and me. And once the sand gets to the bottom, you and I can never get it back. You and I can never get it back. You know, it takes me back to that tape measure that they gave us at Bradford where they said, how, long, how old are you now? How long do you think you're going to live? And I didn't dare do anything less than 100 on the tape. So I thought, if I do 70, it's a negative confession. If I do 80, so I just put 100. I thought, that's a fairly safe bet. Get a telegram that I think I'm done. But you know, it's quite hard when people ask you to... But the point is, he wasn't trying to ask you to put a length on your life. What he was trying to illustrate is just how short a time. I mean, those that were 18 in the room had longer time than me. I think I was in the mid-50s by then, but you just look how time has gone and what time we have left to make a difference in this world. I want to make a difference in this world. I don't know about you. I want to make a difference in this world. Jesus, you know, had the perfect opportunity to be distracted. He was arrested falsely, beaten beyond recognition, back whipped, nailed to a cross, could have been distracted. But a guy on the cross next to him starts saying, I've done a lot of bad stuff. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, in all that pain, struggling to breathe, pushing his legs up to try and get a breath into his body, says, today you will be in paradise. Jesus didn't get distracted no matter where he was. I pray I'll never be on the cross. But Jesus could have been so easily distracted when a man cried out to him, today you will be in paradise with me. God saved your best days till now. Now is the moment for us to grow in Christ, to spread the news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't, I don't mean create something. This is about, you know, Jesus didn't create Bartimaeus. He didn't create Zacchaeus. These were people looking for the moment, and Jesus just didn't pass it by. We've got to be looking for people who are looking for the moment. Put ourselves in that position. Stand, smile, speak, and just answer the question and be what God has called us to be. Just now in this moment, you can experience his grace, you can experience his forgiveness, you can experience his freedom, you can experience his love. Jesus Christ is so amazing. He's got no rival, no equal. That's something I want people to know about. That's something I want people, I want to be in the moment so that God may know And I may know that my best days are now. Tomorrow has got enough to worry about. Tomorrow is not a promise. But here and now today, I can do what I can for the love of Jesus Christ, that other people might know him, grow in him, and become people, children, princes, princesses of the living God this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for your word, Lord God. I pray your word, Lord God, will sink into our hearts, Lord God. Will anything of me, Lord God, will be put to one side. That it's, it's your word, your desire, your anointing for us to live in the moment, Lord God, that we might grow into all things you've created us to be. May we be drawn into that, that moment, Lord God. Drawn into those moments. May we be willing and keep our mind fixed to our feet as we walk, that we'll be in the place physically, emotionally with our feet to engage and to listen and to speak and to be in that moment that others may know that moment and they may say salvation today has come into this house. Amen.
Amen. Look, I think Andrew's going to close for us, but we've not had time for a briefing. So I've got a couple of notices just to, just to, to, to bring out. Um, baptisms, based on what we've been talking about, we're going to go for New Year, New Life, and we're going to do baptisms on the 9th of January. It gives holidays time to be out of the way. It gives shift patterns to be out of the way. It gives time to bring people in and to talk them through what commitment they're making. So if you're online and you want to be baptized, just let me know again and we'll get you into the building. We'll talk you through that. And it sounds a long way off, but you know we're into November tomorrow and then it'd be Christmas and then it'd be baptisms. And we're going to have a pool in the middle. This is breaking down. Steve's had a good go at it for me. Thanks, Steve. But we're not going to... I don't, don't think we're going to get into this place. So, but it's, it's an advantage. God also positives. We can have a pool in the middle. And instead of sitting over a pool that we're worried about everybody falling into, Mike, um, we can have a pool in the middle that we can surround as a family. And everybody can see. There's not just a few on the front row that can look in. We can all be around it. And just pray that it doesn't burst. So baptism, 9th of January, 2021. And um, next week, we're trying to organise training with Ryan on the desk. We need more people to operate the desk. A couple of people have volunteered previously, but Wednesday, if it's a good day for everybody in the evening that's interested, uh, we need some backup for Ryan. Um, we've no news on the baby, have we? I've not heard anything. No. Not yet. no. no. She's at that standing time, really. It's official day for Wednesday. Wednesday, okay. So, <laughs> I've not heard one lady ever say anything different. Uh, it's hard for me to comment because I'm a man and everything gets taken out of context, but uh, I can remember Margaret was always ready. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Andrew was nearly born in the car on the way to the hospital because we waited so long and didn't want to leave. I think we were watching Charmer, Nigel Havers. We didn't want to miss the last... We didn't want to miss the last episode. Well, Margaret didn't want to miss the last episode, put it that way. Um, but... Um, you know, uh, so, so the baby, keep praying for Francine and Scott and that day and that moment, and uh, everything will go uh, well. But we need training on the desk to help Ryan. And, uh, you know, if Ryan needs to take a holiday or break, we need people. And there's a few people who volunteer, but I'm hoping you're going to be available for Wednesday. If you're not, just let me know and we can change the day to Tuesday. But hopefully we can have that training and start to get some backup on the desk. Um, and training on that side of things. So let me know, or Ryan know, if you can help with that after the service. I appreciate that. Great. Are we with you? We've got a closing song. You know, it's just so good to be in fellowship with one another, to be in the moment together. You know, we might stand on occasions in the moment on our own, but it's great to be together in the moment. That holy presence of God touching lives, physically, emotionally, correcting mindsets to know the freedom, to know that Christ has no equal, no rival this morning. Something I strongly believe. Amen. on me like an ocean and I'm caught up in your rolling seas in your love is a place like a wide open space call me out into all I can be I found my
We thank you for your salvation, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your freedom, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the, for the moments that are going to come our way this week, Lord Jesus. We pray we're alert and ready and willing and able, Lord Jesus, in your power to live those moments for you, Lord Jesus. What amazing prayer in that song as well. Um, call me out into all that I can be. And I pray that we all pray that prayer for ourselves this morning. There was a moment in the, when my dad was speaking, in one of the moments where I was actually present, within that time there was a moment where I was present just to prove it I'm gonna I'm gonna use it um but yeah there was a moment where something hit me I mean we've all heard the story or most of us have heard the story of Zacchaeus loads and loads of times but there was a there was a moment where um it just hit me where it said Jesus Jesus invited himself said I'm coming to your house for tea and it just hit me that Zacchaeus had a decision at that point he didn't have to say okay he could have said well I ain't got anything in the cupboard I've not thought about what I'm going to bake. I've not thought about what we're going to, you know, or, or the house isn't ready. It's unclean. It's untidy. He could, have, he could have pushed it off. He didn't push it off. In that moment, it says that he received salvation. Jesus said he received salvation. He received your calling. By accepting the invite. Not just the invite itself, but the acceptance of the invite. And putting everything else to side and saying, yeah, yes, come in, come in. And we've all got that opportunity right now. At all times, Jesus is always saying, I want to come in. I want to come into your house for tea. I want to come into your heart. I want to change your life. I want to give you salvation. I didn't want to let the moment pass this morning about bringing that out and giving anyone the opportunity that hasn't taken that decision or these things that have got in the way and you just, just need to re- refocus and recenter yourself or, or make the decision for the first time that you, yeah, I don't care what's going on. I don't know. I don't care. My house is a mess. There's nothing in their cupboards. But you know what? I want Jesus in my life. I want to invite Jesus into my house for tea tonight, today, this morning. Lord Jesus, I just want to pray for anyone that's in that moment, Lord. We thank you for your invitation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, you want to come into our lives, Lord Jesus, no matter what state we're in, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, Lord Jesus, but that you love us, that you want us for who we are, Lord Jesus, right now in the moment of where we're at right now, Lord Jesus. And just pray, Lord Jesus, that anyone that's in that moment right now, Lord Jesus, you just come into their hearts, Lord Jesus, that they'd open up their hearts and you just come in. Lord Jesus, in the power of your name, you'd set us free. You'd set them free. You'd give your salvation on us, Lord Jesus, like you do. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your power. We thank you for your, your love, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your salvation. In the power of your name, Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you are to us, Lord Jesus, and everything that you've called us to be. In the power of your name, amen. Well, thanks for being with us this morning, church. I pray you've been blessed. I pray you've been encouraged. I pray that you have a great week ahead of you. Uh, stick around for tea and coffee, um, and just have a great week, and we'll see you again same time next week. Amen.